welcome to You Ought to Know, the show where we talk to interesting people about the stuff they're passionate about. My name is Cabinet Otter. I'm your host. And my guest today is one of the most interesting and creative people that I know. He's got his hands in a lot of really cool projects across the board, but what we're going to be talking about today specifically is metal. So with that, welcome Anthony Sino. How are you, my friend? Hello, Otter. I'm doing real fine. Just got off of work. I'm feeling uh, frisky. So let's get into it. I'm ready to roll. That's perfect. We love a spicy chat. Let's do it. Um, so let's start with something that I think seems simple on the surface, but based on what I've heard from you before and a little bit of what I know, this is probably surprisingly complex. And that is, what is metal? Uh, it's uh, it's something you make out of an ore, I hear. God, oh, I just started this off on the worst foot. Everybody clicked off. Sorry for your viewership. That was so bad. So... Um, <laughs> It's really hard to pin down, um, and much has been made about what genres are and aren't metal, and about the purity of, uh, you know, this sort of rock, rock and roll rooted extreme music. Right um, at its core, where you start with metal generally can go. You can trace it all the way back to uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp bringing electric guitar to the gospels, uh, to gospel music, I should say. Um, which, of course, has much deeper roots in American culture um, for a wide variety of reasons. And then, uh, you know, that evolves into R&B and rock and roll, and rock and roll eventually develops into, uh, you know, the kind of two bands that we all kind of, most people are willing to just say, sure, this is where metal starts, Blue Cheer and Black Sabbath, late 60s. And then it gets real hinky from there. So, uh, you know, your best rule of thumb is uh, metal is uh, a, an extreme form of what we might consider music stemming from the roots of rock and roll and, uh, and up-tempo gospel. Um, it, it's, uh, it's funny enough, it is a, it is a, uh, a sibling to R&B, if you ask me. Um, and metal, once you really get into the roots, but you know, you, you have these big, broad genres such as, uh, you know, you've got death metal, uh, you've got <clears throat> black metal, you've got doom metal. Um, you can kind of view those as like the big anchor points, which I would argue they're their own genres. Um, and then within them, it hits all these splinters and it's uh, all of these things are very useful to people who know the language and very horrifying and strange and alienating to people who don't know the language. That's uh, actually one of the reasons I wanted to interview you, because one of my favorite discussions to have uh, every every time we're together is asking you about all of these insane subgenres of metal, because there seem to be thousands of them, and some of them, I swear there's only one band in that genre. Yes. So would love to hear just maybe a few of your favorites or some of the quirkier ones that kind of always catch people's interest. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will. I will start off, or I will append a little thing about genres there, where um, I very intentionally started with gospel, because I think like genres from a distance look like scatter points and they're horrifying, but really they're lineages. Um, mm. Metal, as any other art form, is a, is a dialectic, a conversation within itself. Um, so anyway, so some of my favorite genres. I love. I'm a sucker for funeral doom. Uh, I love, you know, Funeral Doom is a genre that kind of sprang out of the early 90s, uh, where everything is, it's it's 20 minute long songs, uh, heavy, heavy distortion, you might have three guitars, um, you might have a, a, a melody that will sit in the same key and chord structure for three minutes, play the same chord for three, five, ten minutes. Uh, it's very, like, drowning and... Uh, uh, it's it saturates you it 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 uh completely weighs down upon you and then but it's also very beautiful and gentle in how it washes over i'm also just a sucker for death metal broadly um old school death metal that's closer to thrash uh i really like um a lot of stuff that is i, I you know they're regional 
metal also becomes a thing and takes on its own genre. So like I'm a big fan of Swedish death metal, um, which and then there's a lot of stuff that you would typify by calling it the Gothenburg sound. So that'd be bands like At the Gates or stuff like that. Finnish death metal is really great. I like to call a lot of that stuff sewer death metal just because it's very like goopy and nasty. Um, you know, most most music people listen to is tuned to, or is like centered around E, right? Like your standard guitar, the the lowest note is E on the string. So when you talk about tunings, you say like it's standard E, A, D, whatever, right? Um, so like bands like a lot of the bands I like are tuned to A or G, which is just like when you get into tunings, you realize how far weird and stupid it is. Um I definitely am very much about like weirdo death metal and funeral doom, just like esoteric, uh, make you feel real ugly about yourself music. This is potentially uh, either a great or unflattering segue, but if those are your favorites, I know that you're involved with quite a few different bands yourself. Tell us a little bit about those projects and maybe what subgenre they tend to play in. So I've got uh, quite a few active projects, only three of which have anything out that you can listen to right now. Uh, one of the bands I'm in, Feminist Landlord, is actually kind of like a 90s alt-rock band. Oh, cool. We're still figuring out our identity. It started as a pop-punk pop punk band and is now merging into like something that's a little closer to like Kim Deal, The Breeders, um, Pixies-ish kind of stuff, which is really cool. Um, the bands that I'm in that are metal related are the main one is tentacult um where we don't it's really hard to classify us as a genre um uh we we've said many things like uh uh weirdo uh death grind that for your weird uncle um we've it, it's it's death metal that's kind of exemplified by extremely weird time signatures and harsh but beautiful some sort of atonal melodies been a band for like five years we're on transylvanian recordings which is a great label outside of or in uh, oakland wow. that uh just has a lot of really great underground uh, uh extreme music across all genres including ambient and noise and but mostly death metal thrash black metal so we have an album coming out soon uh produced by the immaculate patrick hills out of earth tone studios who's done a lot of great stuff like worked with King Woman, with Church, um, with a lot of great underground musicians. Absolutely great stuff. That'll be called. That's going to be called Lacerating Patterns. Uh, pattern uh, should be coming out, hopefully in August or something. But in the meantime, we have a demo out through Transylvania Recordings uh, called. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Obsidian Blade. You got to forgive me. Like all of the songs we've written, uh, we called them by numbers for very long. So I know they have titles, but in my mind. Obsidian Blade is still one. Well, I mean, and... <laughs> you only have three bands that already have published music. So, I mean, it's not like you have a ton going on. So, mm -hmm. kind of a slacker, no, of course but not. It's, it's okay. We'll yeah, forgive you. Yeah, it up every day. <laughs> so, and so Tentacult's really cool and interesting for fans of stuff like Early Horrendous, Demolich, Gorguts, weird stuff. Slam Taro is another project. Um, it, that is uh, an experience experimental uh it started as something we called anime violence uh it's kind of like a power violence band power violence being a a band that kind of started spun off of thrash and stuff like that it's typified by just like really fast blast beat songs being like 20 seconds long a lot of weirdo stuff like sampling and uh break beats and cross genre stupidity if you've never heard uh, good power violence. I would look up uh, Plutocracy's classic album, Sniping Pigs. Classic, beautiful, very weirdo stuff. So, Slam Taro is uh, it's kind of like a character band. Um, we, I'm violating a lot of stuff by admitting that I'm in Slam Taro. Anyway, it's uh, anime violence uh, centered around Italian culture, cultural pride. Um, 
uh, me and my boy Charlie, we do, uh, he plays drums. I p- play a new instrument on every album. Oh, wow. It's all very sh- uh, one take stuff. Um, so the first out release was just standard five string bass. Second album was two string fretted slide. The third album was a live performance at the Crest Theater in Sacramento that was bass and alto sax. And then the third album at Haleano was baritone saxophone. And we have more stuff in the works. We're planning to make a book and a movie and a few other things. Again, complete slacker. So, yeah. Yep. Oh, and I forgot another band. So the, the third band is Wizard. Uh, okay. W-Y-H-Z-Z-H-A-R-D. A-A-H-R-D. Um and that is a band with my boy Charlie, and uh, uh, and I should note Charlie Passarell is a local, great local Sacramento musician who is in, responsible for Anime Aliens and Bark B R A B A R C. Uh, he's also in uh, Ben Kearns. Uh, he's in Capsule Corp. He's in a lot of really fun uh, guitar centric bands. He puts out like ten albums a year, if not more. Wow. Uh, not counting the stuff he does with me. Under the Anime Aliens moniker, if you're looking for some fun Buckethead inspired stuff, totally go check him out. So, that, him, and my my guy, uh, Bakri, who is a beat maker under the name uh, Octo Mammoth. So, we got together and did a, um, a trad metal. I didn't mention that, like, my favorite bands, Iron Maiden. Um, I love old school metal too. I can't believe I didn't mention that earlier. So we got together and did four tracks of just old school, like each song's kind of a different subset of heavy metal stuff. And every song's about a wizard. Um, and that album is called, it's on Bandcamp. It's called Albuminicus Unfinicus because we never it. finished it. Like all arcane writings, right? Um, never ending. So there's a lot there. But I think where yeah. I want to double tap into is, you know, you play a lot of different instruments. You know, I know your family, you're all very instrumental. So would just love to hear what originally got you interested in music and then how did that transition into actually, you know, picking up instruments and, and going from there? Uh, music was always kind of a priority in the household growing up. Um, our, our father was very insistent on showing us the music that was important to him. We listened to a lot of Alice Cooper, Greg Ken, um, Lou Reed, um, Kansas. Um, weirdly into some prog st- early prog stuff, Genesis, a little bit of Yes. Um, didn't really come out around us. I think that must have been just a phase in his youth that I discovered through his records. Mm. Um, and I always knew music was really important to me but it was the same way with a lot of the other loves in my life i didn't really know how to indulge curiosity if that's a way of putting it so it always seemed to step away from me another world something that was never uh that wasn't gonna that was just part of my life as a an audience member and um it wasn't until this kind of like gnawing need to express myself in any way really started chewing me over. I, uh, Brother Frankie did quite a bit to introduce me to Iron Maiden um, and uh, Morphine. And uh, he didn't want me getting into Primus, I don't think, but I did. Uh, and those three bands, particularly Morphine and Maiden, did a lot to kind of uh, just the way the bass worked, particularly if you've never heard Morphine. So I'm sure, daughter, you have. Yeah, just pausing here. For those of you who don't know, Frankie is Anthony's brother and my husband. So trust me, Morphine and Maiden are constantly playing in our household. Absolutely. As they should be. And yes. Dear viewer, in your household as well, I hope. Because uh, Morphine in particular is amazing. They kind of formed their own genre called Low Rock, you know, it, as they self called it. And, uh, you know, it's all baritone and uh, soprano. No, tenor sax. And uh, two string fretless slide bass and drums and vocals. It's just beautiful, beat poetry esque, uh, wonderful, sensuous music, uh, rich and saturated and 
joyfully somber. And uh, anyway, listening to these for years and years, decades, you know, playing Frankie gave me my first bass. Um, I poked at it for a long time, never figured anything out. Uh, many would argue I still have no idea what I'm doing on a bass guitar, and that's great because I don't. Um, the number one rule is just go do things. Um, it took a long time for me to understand that I just needed to start doing things, and I ended up in a few just bands by accident. Um, Tentacult started when I just started uh, a, a, friend, a meth head who I'd befriended uh, got me pulled into his apartment once a week to just start practicing. And, uh, like, that guy pushed me really hard to <laughs> start learning and taking things seriously. And it's funny enough, like, you just suffer and beat your head against the wall long enough and just say, this doesn't make sense, but I'll just keep playing Guitar Hero with this thing until one day I can get off the rails and then, like, it's just, it it feels awful, it feels awful, it feels awful, and then one day you accidentally do something, you go, oh, it doesn't feel awful anymore. Now it feels awful because I know why I'm doing it wrong, but it's a different kind of awful, it's an accomplished awful. So, I, I got kind of far from your question, but... No, was... no, no. I love it. So, there's a lot there to unpack, as yeah. always. Um, so, I love talking to you, I love talking to Frankie, because... I think a lot of us just consume music and say things like, oh, yeah, I like that song. It's catchy. And the language you use to describe music is so much more precise and in-depth than the color I hear from a lot of people, including myself. That's definitely why we wanted to have you here. So first of all, thank you. Second of all, so you started with bass, and then it sounds like you're picking up more and more instruments as you go. What is that like? How much of it transfers over? Like, I can't play the triangle, so... And I don't even know if that joke is accurate because I don't know how hard it is to play a triangle. So how did you <laughs> see complete ignorance? So how do you go from, you know, kind of picking up the bass to playing a different instrument on multiple albums? What does that look like? Well, I do I, two things I really want to make clear here. One, if you listen to those albums and uh, you don't. And if you know something about music, although I don't think you need to know something about music to catch this, uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. You can hear it. It's real bad. I love it. The The multidisciplinary thing, uh, you know, one, one thing I've learned uh, is that there's no such thing as wasted knowledge. And I've changed careers and life paths and uh, so many things, so many times. My fundamental worldview has changed hundreds of times over through repeat exposures to new, different types of people, different social groups, different expectations in the workplace, through different career paths, those kinds of things. Um, and as somebody who's been learning to indulge his curiosity more by learning to, like, there are a lot of things that are very important to me that I share with you and with Frankie and a lot of other people. It's like uh, comic books, and the history of them is very important to me. Uh, video games, uh, as you can see, some people may have recognized that I've got a PVM here. And the people who know what that is know that that means uh, I'm a freak about CRTs, about uh, vintage video gaming, and uh, treating that with dignity and respect. And I'm also, I used to be a competitive magic player, and blah, 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 blah right? Um, and I think all of us are this in our own way. Uh, but the thing I've learned from repeatedly starting fresh, entering a world that I know nothing about, uh, you know, a school of thinking, a, uh, a history, uh, a social scene uh, in which you insert yourself in the middle and have to figure out how to grasp things together and create a through line of what has happened and where things are going and who's where. Um, it is very much the same thing with music, with learning to cook uh, a new style of cuisine, with learning to drive a car, with anything else in our life. Uh, the, the beauty of being an autodidact, of teaching yourself things, is that you slowly come to realize that all knowledge is the same. That you can ask yourself, you, you may not know what questions to ask, but you know how to, you learn how to recognize the roots. You learn to recognize what questions you should be asking. 
So when it came to playing bass, um, one of the things about Tentacult is that we play in, uh, me and my guitarist Tyler, our guitarist, my is weird, uh, we play in different tunings. I play in B standard, B-E-A-D-G, and he plays in drop B. So the only string we have in common is our lowest B, and then all of his is shifted up uh, a whole step. So that means that I have to, if I'm trying to copy something that he's playing, or at least even figure out what key or whatever, I have to transpose. I have to change positionings and figure things out. Um, so when it came to playing saxophone, the saxophone is a trans transposing instrument in that uh, there's the concert tuning. It means like guitars, pianos, that kind of stuff are all in what you call concert tuning, where the notes are the notes are the notes. But saxophones, when the way the way they're written on sheet music, depending on the family of saxophone, they're actually in a different key. So, like a barit, I play baritone and alto, and those are E flat, which means that on the sheet music, it'll tell me to play a C. But if I'm playing a C as directed on a saxophone, even though I'm calling it a C, it is actually a concert A. So, like, through that private, pr prior experience with bass, I already had some experience with that, mm. right? And so, and, like, prior experience in bass being, like, okay, my main technique's, like, uh, I need to, if in order to sound a good note, I need to figure out how to hold the instrument, where to put my thumb, whether or not I need to be muting with my left hand and or my right, how that does that, how my, what the technique demands, blah, 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 which then translates to learning very similar things in saxophone, like, um, how I hold my tongue, how I, whether, how much lip I use on the read, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it just comes from a very similar position of like, all right, I need to sound an A. Well, what does an A mean? And what is an A in relation to these other things? So you focus on the A, focus on the A, and that starts inviting these other questions. And then you start asking the questions. And as you research the answers to those questions, these other questions come up and you make the note and say, that's for tomorrow's practice. Um, I'm, I'm very verbose, so for, <laughs> forgive me. Feel free no, to it's, just it's, stop me at any point. It's absolutely fascinating, um, which is why we wanted you here on the show. Um, so definitely appreciate it. And I love that it's very much a about, you know, getting curious and taking yourself on this journey and not being afraid to just dig in and start trying stuff and learning as you go, which is very self-directed. But I want to be cognizant, right, that it's not just you because you're not just learning on your own. You very actively are involved with other projects, other creatives who I'm sure have their own vision. You know, you mentioned Charlie, who you work with a lot. My last guest was literally a DJ who quit rock bands because he was tired of working with other people. So I'd love to hear what are those dynamics like? How do you guys manage all those personalities is it, you know, a helpful process? Is it a painful process? Just what does it look like? I'm really gl glad you brought up the social dynamic. Um, one thing I neglected to mention earlier in like the musical path is like the most important thing for me was just one night saying, I need to start going to shows. I need to start seeing bands because this is important to me and I want to know what's here and I want to be a part of it. Um, and I had years and years where I would go from anywhere from two to five shows a week wow, just to go and like make friends and see stuff. And, you know, when I started that process in like 2013, 2014, I wanted so badly to be a musician and to make music. And it, you know, it took years of just making connections and saying that and wishing it and not doing the work because I didn't know how to be curious and being scared and knowing that it was going to cost a lot of money and all this stuff, but just going and being out there, I met the people and had enough opportunities where somebody said, made a dumb joke. And I said, yes, let's do it. What are you doing Tuesday? I'm booking this. I'm going to waste your time and not know how to play my instrument with you. And you're going to know, and you're going to yell at me a lot. Um, so when it comes to like being in bands, and like working with other people, I make a, I view it the same way as like choosing roommates. Like I get into bands because I want to do something with those people. 
and I don't put too much emphasis. Like we're very clear about what sort of project we're working on. We're very clear about like what we expect out of each other and stuff. But you know, the end result is not what's important. What's important, and this is not the case for every band. I want to be very clear. Like a lot of people have different reasons for getting into why they do it. And some bands are very mercenary. Um, some bands are led by a brilliant person who has every idea laid out. Some bands are very collaborative. Some bands are completely improvised. Um, what matters is not that everything matches up. Uh, what matters is that you're generous and that you're patient and that you understand that you could know all the theory in the world, but the language isn't really what matters. What matters is how somebody needs to be heard and how somebody needs to be told. Um, so it's a long and grueling and collaborative process and you get frustrated with people very quickly, very easily. Um, and so I don't, I don't, there are a lot of people who have very good reasons for working alone. And if it, if that gives them everything they need, hell yeah. Who gives a shit? You know, we've only got so much time here. Just do the thing you want to do. Now, if you want to make money, if you want to not lose thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours of your time to put out an album on Bandcamp and have three people tell you they liked it and two people say the mix is all fucked up, then don't take my path. And of course, the mix will never be fucked up because Pat Hills did ours. He's an angel. He's too good. He did a great job in spite of us. So, like, what I'll say is that uh, what matters is being, and it's the same in any art form. Um, it's the same in anything you do in your life. You got to do it because you want to. You got to want to work with those people for some reason, for whatever that is, you know, because you have a good vibe, because you genuinely respect them, because they teach you things, because, uh, you know, you know, the only thing is like, don't, don't get in a band with somebody you have a crush on. That's, that's maybe the one thing. Interesting. You know? Don't do that because, uh, you're going to waste a lot of energy. You're probably going to mm. break up the band at some point. That person's probably going to feel like an asshole because like you've, or well, not like an asshole, but like, they're going to, you know what? It's obvious. Don't do that. <laughs> I like that. There is some very beautiful, metaphors there that could be not even metaphors but concepts that can be applied to everything right be generous it's not about the language it's about making the other person feel heard and beautiful things but then also like don't listen to internet trolls and don't join a band that you it, it goes from the very high level conceptual to very practical things which i absolutely adore um what do you wish you had known when you got started uh that i could have started anytime anytime um the only difference between because i've done i've done so many different artistic projects like live exhibitions i've i've done performance events i've directed plays i've done all this kind of stuff um and all of it is just me looking at my friends when we make a really dumb joke and going hey wait but what what well what if what if <laughs> And, you know, obviously that never would have happened without wonderful friends and without having it modeled by, you know, one of my great co-conspirators out here, Devin McMines, he is, he's responsible for a lot of the projects I've worked with him on, including our, uh, we've done multiple plays about the Grinch, uh, which you can find on YouTube and on Twitch. Uh, the first play was called How the Grinch Stole Christ. Uh, it was about the Grinch fighting God in family court over the bastard son Christ. And so just to pause, one of the things we do here on the show is in addition to the list of questions that I send you beforehand, we ask you a surprise question to get you to have a genuine reaction and try to make you laugh on camera. Uh, and ours was absolutely going to be, tell me about the Grinch musicals, tell me about the Grinch plays, and you've just ruined that. So I, I regret having you here, but go on. You can't surprise me. I'm too wily and cunning like the Grinch. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But one of my favorite so, projects. So please tell us, tell us. Thank you. Uh, well, let's move away from the Grinch. Let's get to the question later. To, to answer the question at hand, if I might. Mm -hmm. 
And then I'll talk about the Grinch all day. Just to make sure I don't leave this one behind. The most important thing was like, I felt so separated um, from art. I knew I was creative, but I felt powerless. I felt like I didn't have the tools. And I didn't. Um, but it's one of the ways that American culture looks at art has, you know, so many different ways of being about auteurs, about greats, about, um, particularly if you're not, if you haven't put in much, you know, finding new music is a ton of work and it's intimidating and it's alienating, be it metal or anything else. Um, which is part of what was great about going to shows because metalheads are some of the friendliest people you'll ever meet. If you meet, if you're in a room with angry, like not friendly metalheads, that's probably a sign that that metal also sucks. Sincerely, there's like a correlation there. I could go into it forever. But the point is, like, it was other people. Just talking to other people and going like, well, what do you do? What do you, like, how do you, like, you make this beautiful music. Like, tell me about how you learn music theory. And they go, bro, I don't know what a chord is. I know that if I put my fingers here, it makes a cool sound. Right, And then you get enough stories like that and hear all the different ways that people accomplish these incredible things that you could never imagine doing. And it just always comes back to like, I don't know, I picked up the guitar, man. You know, I picked right. up the paintbrush. I, right. you know, I went outside. It always comes down to that. Um, and I wish I understood that. Um, one artist told me something that has just guided my life for like seven years or something now it's he said love is curiosity just very simply if you love something ask questions get aggressive dig in you know do you ask yourself a question do you know like this album do you know the albums that inspired it do you know the musical lineage do you know anything about the theory do you know the other projects the artists are in do you know anything about how to recreate those bass tones, like those tones? Do you know any of that? What question's interesting? Go chase it. That's amazing. No, I think that's a beautiful question. I think it applies to basically any discipline or any relationship in your life. So that's beautiful. We've talked a lot about community and I want to pause a little bit there just because, you know, obviously there's the people you're directly working with to create. But there's a much broader community there that you're networking with to find these gigs, to find these opportunities. What's your advice for people other than just, you know, going to shows, going to places where those people are at? How do you strike up conversations with people? Obviously, you're a very, you know, willing to make friends wherever you go is how I would describe it. Um, so I'd just love to hear <laughs> what's your advice for maybe people who aren't as, as courageous as you might be? Well, what I'll tell you is that I... Uh, some people don't believe this about me, but I'm an introvert. Um, I very much need alone time. I very, and a, a lot of gregarious people are. Um, but I'll say this, that like, um, I don't want to put this. It's a natural byproduct of being there. Um, and it doesn't have to mean going to shows, especially with COVID stuff right now. I don't blame anybody for having feelings about being in rooms or going out to things like whatever that's yeah. fine but it's about it's about being there and about making yourself present like when i first started going to metal shows i was also a journalist lurking, working for the the local all weekly and i really wanted to give some exposure and get people to access these underground shows and like become a part of the culture to not just, like, take their credibility and say, like, I know about these bands, therefore I'm a good writer, or I know my shit. It was very much like, this is a symbiotic thing. I made a very intentional choice to not write about that stuff until those people had seen me at so many shows for at least a month or two. And I told them who I was and why I was there, but also that I genuinely love this stuff. And we just had conversations. I was like, just tell me, man, tell me about the scene. Tell me about whatever. Right. A lot of people don't have that very easy in of just being like, Hey, I'm a journalist. <laughs> tell like, teach me like I'm a baby, but you do have the easy end of just going in and being like, finding the most excited guy and being like, wow, this show is sick. I wish I could see more stuff like this. What, what else is going on? People love 
to just, well, I mean, look at me right now. You ask me one question, I'll go for 10, 20 minutes. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Most people, like, yeah, maybe once in a while people would be like, I want nothing to do with you. Sure. That happens all the time. Don't take it personal. But, you know, the truth is just like, just go talk to, like, by being in a place and by talking to people, they start to know who you are and they start to tell you things because they want you to be a part of it too. And so when it finally came time for me to start booking shows, to show everybody what I've been working on, these guys knew who I was. And they were like, oh my God, you have a band now? Yes, let's go. Oh and they, God. you know, there you go. And the band, the stage that I've been looking at this whole time, suddenly I'm on it. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, it's not like that's a big deal, you know, but it is too. It's a very big deal. And it's, you took the time to be a genuine member of their community because you loved it and were passionate and they showed up for you just like you showed up for them. So that's, right. yeah, that's it. Right. I mean, it's the same way that, like, you're a Twitch streamer. If you don't know who the other Twitch streamers are, if you're not making raids happen for other people, if you're not, right? No, like, I promote no one. I am I hate community bond. No, I'm <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's that's why I do this show, because a lot of people who watch the show are, you know, YouTube creators. They're Twitch streamers. And so what can we learn from other fields? Because there is so much overlap between what you guys do and what we do. It's just a slightly different mode of expression right but yeah that's exactly why we're here absolutely absolutely um what's your favorite part of this whole process uh for me it's the stage um which can kind of be contradictory with what i was saying about like the end result not mattering um but what i mean to say is that like if you aren't enjoying the process then there's no then there's nothing to enjoy unless well for overly emotive freaks like me. And I think a lot of people, at least to get them started, it is really, really important to understand the craft. And like for me, the stage is this nice synthesis of everything where it's... You know what? Actually, I'm, I'm over-intellectualizing it. I like attention. And I like showing... I like putting on a show. And uh, it's not why I do it, but it is this wonderful byproduct to just say, hey, check this out. You know, it's just fun. I like having the lights on me. I like, uh, I like the festivity of it. I like that people can come and feel like they're doing something special tonight. Um, that, like, you can see the people who've been coming to every show and they're still, like, headbanging. It's like, we're, it must have been good if we can do it twice. And then you see, like, the new people. Like, we play a lot of all-ages venues. And, like, seeing 15-year-olds just losing their minds and then come up and start asking me about my gear and start debating about, like, which distortion pedal sucks the most. Like, I don't know, man. That's the best. Because yeah. that's me. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. for me, it's for me, it's the stage because... That's the culmination of everything that's important to me, which is this community of people just getting together and saying, hell yeah, dude, in a circle. So emotionally, when you're performing, knowing that you're kind of an introvert, but you have a lot of fun kind of doing this live self-expression, what does that feel like? There's got to be a lot going on there, right? Uh, in, a, in a way. I mean, um, I have through a lot of kind of like what you might call implosion therapy, just learn to channel anxiety into this ebullient, just completely aggressive identity. And um, there's something really, one of the most powerful things about metal, like particularly as somebody like, you know, not, not I, I don't like using a lot of these things, but I will say like as somebody who's neurodivergent, who has like depression and all these other things that I take medication for, one of the most appealing things about metal is that it uh, gives a space to convey the world as I often see it. And it is not just a crude catharsis, but it is also my language. Um, one that is aggressive and nihilistic, uh, but also hopeful and empowering. And uh, when you get on the stage 
and everything that you've worked toward that you've put in hundreds and hundreds of hours and thousands and thousands of dollars and developed all these calluses and had all these hopes and dreams about and it's all distilled into whether or not you can hit that 132nd note right it's beautiful because it translates everything from this weird calcified static thing into this extremely dynamic and fluid experience and there are so many thoughts uh especially like I, i've been diagnosed but never treated for adhd and that kind of stuff uh you know there are so many times i just like forget that i'm on stage even and i remember like oh i'm playing like a really intense line right now i better remember what's coming up next um, in practice, that happens all the time. On the stage, your body and your mind change, and it becomes a very zen, it's do or die, but without any pressure. It's just happening. That's Here we are. Really funny to hear, because I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but I'm diagnosed ADHD, and that's one of the things that got me into streaming, is because I am on and I'm completely focused for that period because it's a performance and I'm not my weird ADHD self anymore. I'm actually a living person. So definitely very relatable. Mm -hmm. That hyper focus, it kicks in and it's the world. It really is. Um, I feel sad for all the normies who never get to have it. Yes. It's it's beautiful. The beauty Um, of the slipstream. Exactly. That flow. Um, so, you know, you mentioned going to venues, seeing new people react to your music for the first time, knowing that we live in a modern world and people are discovering things on social media and all sorts of places. Do you guys promote your music? How do people find you other than running into a venues? You're laughing, so I'm sure your social media strategy is on point. I'm so excited to hear it. Yeah, no. Um, I try. We all try. Tentacult does have an Instagram Okay. Uh, Slam Taro itself doesn't, um, but the characters of Slam Tar- Taro, Hamthony and Chartaro, have it. I haven't posted on Hamthony's account in more than a year, I'm sure. You know, I have a Twitter account where I, I mean, I've got a lot of leftover followers from when I was a journalist, so I'm sure they hate seeing it. But uh, basically, whenever an album comes out, I'll post about it twice and be like, yeah, here, you know, six years of my life. There it is. Let's go. So how we find a lot of our people, it's weird. It's just word of mouth for us. Um, I don't know how many people like Tentacle. It seems like more than I, a lot more than I thought. I'm certainly going to try and do an actual media campaign for the album proper because, you know, it's our first album coming out. The demo is, it was a demo. It's good, but in comparison to what the album is, completely different thing, right? The The real thing is, uh, it's one of the drawbacks of everything I was just talking about. Like, we're there because we want to be and because we want to do the music. We don't, we kind of have this uh, unfortunate, we kind of don't care what you think or if you're going to buy the album in a way. We're starting to care a lot more. Um, but no, but that is a drawback that's... of the way of thinking. That's kind of where you are right now, right? It's it's where you are in your journey. Sometimes it's not about promoting. It's about getting the process and what you want it to be, you know? So that's totally fair. We're learning and we're adapting. But, like, we we started from a place of we don't care. We're going to do this either way. But now it's like, well, no. We have a label who really supports us. And we think we've really made something good here. And it it's changing. Yeah. Um, and it's an interesting process and evolution, just like anything else. I love that this ties back into what you said earlier about there's no wasted knowledge. You know, I do PR for a day job. You used to be a journalist. Uh, media campaign is not something I hear a lot of people say. And I can tell that's coming from your journalism background. And now it's applying to this new thing. So it really is no such thing as wasted knowledge. You can always take skills from your other aspects of your life and and push them forward. So I know we talked a little bit about, you know, people when they first get into metal might be a little intimidated just because there are so many people like you who know so much about this whole aspect, whether it's the music itself, the community, what would you recommend for someone who maybe didn't grow up with it, maybe has never been that exposed to metal and 
wants to get started but doesn't know where to begin? Two things. One, go to shows. Just start talking to people. Like, hey, I like this band. Who else is like them? Right? Uh, the other thing is to not worry too much. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, when I was, it was around like 2012, 2013, where I really started asking questions and going like, I love extreme metal. Why do I not? Why don't I know anything? I don't know about the history or whatever. So I just did a very simple like, Okay, I heard people say death metal. I heard people say black metal. I heard people say doom metal. Or I like one of my favorite bands when I was getting into uh, extreme music was Skeleton Witch, and okay. like they refer to themselves as blackened deathly thrash. So I'm like, okay, that's a thrash metal thing. I've been listening to the thrash metal. I hear the thrash as I got in here. But what does blackened mean? What does deathly mean? And then you kind of dig around and you realize like, oh, people really don't necessarily blackened thrash is kind of a thing, but not really. But what does black metal mean? And then you kind of like, you look it up, you look up the history, you see some of the bands and you know, you just like, okay, I see this band, toss this into Spotify. Um, The most important thing is to recognize that when we're doing all the genre stuff, um, some people are very serious about it. And usually those people are uh, fools and or Nazis. Um, one thing, if you're getting into metal, it's, there's a huge anti-fascist, anti-racist, like most people in metal are, if not left wing at the very least anti-racist and that kind of stuff. But that being said, it is, especially when you're digging into the history of metal, if you're looking up an older band, it is usually worth Googling the name and then going racist. Um, I will say, but the most important thing about the genre is, is that it's about like lineages it's about aspects of the music that take a long time for people to develop the language and even people who are really strict about genres can't even talk about Um, it's taken me years to kind of develop these very fine linguistic things all because i want to so that i can trace threads if it's not useful to you then don't let other people tell you it is right so the most important thing is to do it because you heard something you liked and want to know more about it. That like, you know, if you looked up Skeleton Witch, you really loved Skeleton Witch and you see Black and Deathly Thrash and you don't know anything about those, well, you can see that those are adverbs and this are an adjectives and this is the the proper part. That This is the noun we're modifying here, thrash. Okay, I'm going to start with thrash. What is thrash metal? And then it goes, it gives you the whole thing like, yeah, it's like a... It led into thrashcore and death metal, thrashcore becoming grime metal, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I don't care any bit of that. What are the big thrash bands? Oh, okay, Creator, Overkill, whatever, right? Band, what's their big album? Boom, go put it on, right? And yeah. then from there, let that, you know, look into the other elements and figure out, like, what you liked and what you didn't. Well, I liked that the guitar was fast. I didn't like the solos. I didn't like the vocals. Why didn't I? Um, the one thing I'll tell you... There is one genre that is worth noting. If you see NSBM, that means National Socialist Black Metal, i.e. explicitly Nazi stuff. Got it. So stay away. Stay away from that. Got from it. NSBM. That is a pro tip. Um, yeah. I love that, you know, whether you're playing music, creating, getting into the community, or just trying to find your way into listening for the first time, your advice is essentially just get curious and don't let other people stop you. Mm -hmm. And what, it's really easy to do stuff. Like, I love taking shots at, easy shots at, like, Pantera or Dragon Force or whatever. If that's what you're into, who cares? Right? And if it's important for you to, like... The important thing about like what other feel other people feel about music that you listen to is community, not whether or not it's actually good. Like I used to, I let people tell me Blind Guardian sucks. It's so cheesy, and I believe like I didn't listen to Blind Guardian for a long time. Blind Guardian is like power metal about like Tolkien and and uh, Stephen King and stuff, right? It's the corniest shit possible. It rules. And I didn't listen to Blind Guardian for years because I was an idiot who was like, people are going to laugh at me. People laugh at me all the time. Look at me. I'm a joke anyway. It's fine. Listen to Blind Guardian. Well, I don't think you're a joke. I think you're an incredibly genuine and authentic person, which is what I love. Thank you so much for being here. I think 
your journey as a creator is so fascinating just because you have all of these intersectional facets and also because you are genuinely curious about these things and you know so much and you get so deep and your passion about all of it shines through which is what we love to see here on the show so just thank you so much for being here we're going to drop links in the description so people can listen to feminist landlord wizard and buy the tentacle album when it comes out in late summer as well as hopefully catch some grinch projects and just thank you again for being here yeah and thank you so much uh forgive me for going off uh but you know get excited about something that's the only thing i have to say hey it's me cabinet otter thanks so much for watching if you like this video please give it a thumbs up subscribe if you want to see more or come hang out with me live on twitch see you soon